Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're here, especially if you're visiting with us this morning. Welcome. It's good to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And if you're also joining us online, welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, and we hope that the audio and the video is a little better. If you will do me one quick favor, if you have a smartphone, if you will please go into the settings and make sure that your Wi-Fi is off, make sure that you're not connected to our Wi-Fi network, that will make sure we free up enough bandwidth to make sure that we uh, have enough to give everybody who's watching at home a nice clear picture and sound. And so if you would, just go into your settings and, and turn off your Wi-Fi uh, just for the next hour so that we can make sure people watching from home don't uh, buffer. And so welcome to Grace Press. My name's Dave Latham. I'm the pastor here. We're glad that you are here with us this morning, especially if you're here visiting. Grace is a church that seeks to know the full life that's found in Jesus Christ. And we want to share that life with those here in our own city, our state, and even around the world as the Lord gives us opportunity to. And so we want you to know that wherever you are in the spiritual spectrum, whether you've been a Christian your whole life or you're a complete skeptic or somewhere in between, we want you to know that it's okay that you're not okay. And what we mean by that is that if you're not a perfect person, if you still are wrestling with some of the big questions of life, basically if you don't have it all put together, you're going to find yourself to be in good company here. We long to be a church that leans into the grace of Jesus and looks to the cross because through that cross, Jesus has made us okay. And so we are glad that you're here with us this morning. If you are joining us online again this morning, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And if you uh, get a chance, please feel free to go to graceprez.org. You should have the website on the little logo down here on the bottom. Feel free to go there and uh, you can pull up today's uh, bulletin right here that you can have uh, with you as we move through the service. So just a couple of quick announcements for you here. This coming Wednesday night, I'm going to continue on as we do our Gospel Project lesson at 6.30. I'll be recording that and posting it uh, onto YouTube, and so just be aware of that. Also, if you listen to WZOB, I'll be doing a series of like little 15-minute uh, talks at 9 o'clock on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week. And so uh, thanks for John Matthew for setting that up uh, for me. And so... Uh, if you, uh, if you follow along 9 a.m., you can, if you don't get enough of this voice in your ear, you can have a little bit more. So, uh, just be aware of that. Uh, also <clears throat> next week we are going to, I've noticed, um, you know, most folks are fine with the nine o'clock and it seems like most people are the folks that we have that are coming each week are coming to our, you know, in-person service and welcome. And we've got folks that are uh, watching from home and we're glad that you're here too. And so next week, what we're going to do is we're going to shift since we're really only going to do one service. We're going to shift to a 10 o'clock. Okay, so we're going to shift to 10 o'clock. Moving forward, 10 o'clock in-person service as well as online. And so make sure, just kind of be aware of that. Give everybody a little bit more chance to maybe get down the mountain, get a cup of coffee, do whatever you need to do. 10 o'clock, moving forward. We're going to have a 10 o'clock worship service in person and online. And then we're going to try that for a few weeks and see how that looks. And so just, we'll send reminders out and all that, but just while you're... Um, while you're making notes, just do that. Also, on the closing hymn, if you'll notice, we're going to, to give a little bit of time for the Lord's Supper. If you'll just mentally make a note or with your pencil, we're going to add a refrain after the second verse where it says, For my pardon, this I see. We're going to add the chorus there, the refrain. And then we're also going to, Callum's going to play a little instrumental uh, in between there just for you to have a chance to, if that's where you want to take the supper. And, I'll, and we'll go through that uh, this morning. You should have received a little uh, communion elements packet when you came in, a little prepackaged element. And just want to demo that for you just real quickly in case you forgot. There's actually two tabs on the very top. You don't do it with me because you're going to end up with grape juice in your lap, okay? But you have, there's one little clear tab on top that gets you the wafer on top. And then you pull the big purple tab underneath slowly and carefully. <laughs> Uh, to, to access the juice underneath, okay? And so these are sealed uh, for your safety. And so if you did not get one, uh, go talk to uh, Eddie in the back and he will make sure that he, gets, he got you one or that you have one for the supper. And I will go over instructions and how we're going to do that. Um, finally, one more quick announcement. We had a session meeting uh, the other night that went really well. Thank you for, for praying for that. And um, we have a lot of needs in our church body, uh, a lot of physical needs, we have a lot of, you know, needs in our own community and in our state and our nation. And so the session, uh, we talked about it, and we're calling for a focused time of prayer coming up. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to put together a little almost prayer calendar. I know we do that each week in the back of your bulletin. But what we're going to do is we're going to put together almost a little prayer calendar for you to use. And we're going to ask at specific times, if you're available, uh, to be able to join in prayer so we can all unite our prayers together as a church as we go before the throne of grace. And so that will be being put together. will probably be put out by Wednesday is my hope. And we'll, we'll have all that kind of focus time there so that we can all pray together on behalf of our nation, on behalf of those who are sick and hurting in our congregation and all the other needs that are out there. And so just want you to be aware of that and would please ask you to just pray with us as we go before the Lord and ask him uh, to help us. And we trust him. And so just be on the lookout for that. We'll send multiple reminders out and all that going forward. Okay. Oh, one more thing. I forgot. Senior night. Callum, do you want to say something about this, it? This Wednesday night, we have rescheduled our annual senior night for our graduating seniors. We have nine graduating seniors this year, a huge chunk of our youth group. And so we are very sad to see them go, but also very excited to just see how the Lord is going to continue working their lives moving forward. So if you are free Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'd love to have you join us here in the sanctuary, just like we're doing right now. Um, just be conscious of the social distancing protocols and mask wearing and everything. So we usually do the fellowship hall, but we'll do it in the sanctuary this year. And, um, and kind of keep it you know, short and sweet as well. And just uh, time to kind of celebrate them and, and uh, kind of send them off into the, their various um, next stages of life. Yeah, great. And uh, what I'll do also with the, with the Wednesday night thing is I'm probably going to record it probably tomorrow or Tuesday and have it ready for you. And so if you're here at senior night, the video will be available for you for Gospel Project beforehand. But we're thankful for our seniors. Uh, sad to see, you know, y'all move out and go, but also very excited for you. It's kind of bittersweet at the same time. And so a chance to celebrate y'all and pray for you. Okay, I think that is the last announcement that I had, uh, and so thanks for hanging out uh, with me. I try to keep them as you know, short as possible. We had a lot of ground to cover this morning. Also, make note that you have a few quotes there at the top of your bulletin that we're going to reference in our sermon, especially if you're visiting. That's, that's why those are there. And now let's, let's uh, do our memory verse together. So one thing that we do as a church from month to month is we take a particular verse of Scripture, and we try to memorize it together as a church body, so that over the course of the year, Lord willing, by the time we hit December, we've got 12 verses that we have hidden in our hearts together. And so let's look at this memory verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. Let's recite this through together. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. A good verse and a good reminder for us this morning, especially as we continue in our study through Hebrews and the Lord promising to walk with his people and has promised to uh, and has promised an eternal reward for them. And so we are grateful for that. Well, let's stand together this morning as we are called to worship, as we enter into worship through every season of life. Our God is the Most High King who rules over all the earth. He rules and reigns, and His rule is holy and good. And we rest in His sovereignty as His people. And we praise Him and Him alone for His loving kindness. And so as we are called to worship this morning, let's recite the words there from Psalm 47, verses 1 through 2 together, and then I will open us in prayer. Let's be called to worship this morning. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy, for the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great King over all the earth. Let's pray as we are called to worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, your people, come together on your day with songs of joy in our hearts, because you are the Lord Most High, and you are to be feared, you are to be awed, you are to be honored, you are to be worshipped. Why? Because you alone rule and reign, you are the great King. And you have made a way for your people. Lord, may that stir our hearts this morning as we look to your word, as we pray together, as we sing together, as we worship together, either here in person or online. Lord, we as your church body gather together in the spirit and we ask and pray that you would meet us here. Be pleased with our worship this morning, we pray. We ask these things humbly in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Let's remain standing this morning as we confess our sin corporately, followed by a time of silent confession. So we do this each week because the Lord calls us to come and to confess our sins. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not a fun thing to do. I know if you're anything like me, you do not like to confess your sins before a holy God because you're reminded yet again of just how far you fall short. But yet we're called to do it. We're called to come before our Lord because he loves us. And so let us confess our sin before the Lord corporately using the words there printed in your bulletin, followed by a time of silent confession. I'll read the normal face print and let's all respond together in the bold. Jesus, you have offered us all your blessings when you announced blessed are the poor in spirit. But we have been rich in pride. Blessed are those who mourn. But we have not known much sorrow for our sin. Blessed are the meek, but we are a stiff-necked people. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but we are filled to the full with other things. Blessed are the merciful, but we are harsh and impatient. We plead with you to forgive our sins and give us the blessing of your righteousness. That in our hearts, let's go before the Lord confessing our sins silently. Amen. It is never easy to confess our sin corporately or silently. I know as we have gone through, as we were going through the the words there, I have been rich in pride. I have not known much sorrow for my sin. I am a stiff-necked person. I am filled to the full with other things. I can be very harsh and impatient. And so, like you, I come before the Lord and plead for forgiveness and plead for mercy. But yet, if you were here... And you know Christ, even on the heels of confessing your sin, as hard as it is to do. I have some really good news for you. God has made a way. Be reminded of the gospel. Hear this assurance of pardon and grace from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Is that not good news? That is such good news. We have redemption and we have forgiveness according to his grace and according to what he has done. May that stir our hearts this morning as we worship and continue to worship. You may be seated. If you would please join me in prayer as we go before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, your people, gather together on your day, both here in person and online as a church, to worship you and adore you alone. We thank you, O Lord, that you have set aside this one day in seven for us to rest, for us to worship, for us to be still and know that you are God. And so thank you for the great privilege and the great blessing of the Sabbath. And Lord, we come to you and we praise you and you alone for your faithfulness towards your people, for your covenant love for your grace and for your mercy and your patience towards us, O Lord. You are good. And we praise you, O Lord, because you are the one true and living God, and we lift our hearts up to you. And yet, Lord, we come confessing all the ways that we have rebelled against you, all the ways that we have tried to live our lives apart from you. We ask that you would forgive us, O Lord. We come confessing so many sins to you, O Lord, those we have committed on purpose, those we don't even know that we've committed, O Lord, but you know them. And we come before you, O Lord, confessing our sin, but we are thankful, thankful that you are faithful, and faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, not because of anything that we have done, but simply because of the finished work of Christ and your grace. And so, O Lord, it is through Christ's precious name, with the help of the Holy Spirit, That we come to you and we offer our request to you, O Father. And we trust and know that you hear us. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing persecution. And as we pray each week, we ask and pray that you would be with your church worldwide. And we rest in the promises, O Lord, that the gates of hell will never prevail against your church. And that you love your church. We continue to pray for the unrest in our land, O Lord. 
And we do humble ourselves as your people before you, and we ask you to heal us, O oh Lord. Father, heal our hearts, heal our church, heal our land, O oh Lord. We repent, and we come before you with repentance in our hearts, Lord, pleading and crying out for mercy, O oh Lord. But we are thankful for your grace. We continue to pray for those impacted by the coronavirus worldwide and for all those frontline workers who work so tirelessly each and every day, putting their own lives at risk, O oh Lord, to care for others. We pray for all those here in our own uh, county, O oh Lord, who might be sick with COVID right now. And we pray, Father, that you would draw near to them. And we pray, Lord, that the church here in this county would unite together to, Lord, bring love and encouragement and care for those who are ill. We pray for our local, state, and national leaders. They do not have an easy job right now, O oh Lord, and we pray for them. We pray that you would give them wisdom, humility, and a fear of the Lord. We pray for our officers, leaders, committees, all those who serve so faithfully each week as we try to move forward in these unprecedented times as a church, and we ask and pray that you would give us wisdom. We pray for our denomination, the PCA, and all the churches and campus ministers in the bounds of Providence Presbytery. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to you and hold each other accountable as, Lord, we strive to uh, pursue holiness together. We pray for all the churches and pastors that we serve alongside in our community, and we say thank you for them, O oh Lord. And we pray that you would grant us all faithfulness as we work together for the good of your kingdom. This morning, O oh Lord, we come and we pray on behalf of Reverend Mike Miller at Ruhema Baptist Church. Lord, who has just started his ministry there, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with him as he continues to adjust to a new town and new people and a new rhythm. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with Reverend Miller and the folks at Ruhema Baptist. Please be with them, O oh Lord. We pray for our own church, Grace Prez, and pray that you would give us wisdom and courage as we seek to share the good news. We pray for all the missionaries that our church supports through faith promise giving, and we pray and ask that you would help us to continue to be gracious and generous givers. We pray for all those in the various stages of life and the unique challenges that accompany each stage, young and old, O oh Lord. You love and walk with your people as their good shepherd, and we give you praise for that. We pray for those who have served in the military, for those who are currently serving, as well as their families. And we long for the day of the Lord, O oh, oh Father, when you return and swords will be beaten into plowshares and we will no longer need soldiers and war will be no more. We pray for those struggling with addiction, loneliness, depression, anxiety, or just sheer exhaustion here in our church and also in our community. And we pray that you would help them to know your love and your mercy and draw near to them. We pray for those battling cancer. We pray for those who are sick and hurting. And we pray that you would heal and comfort them, O oh Lord. We pray for our single moms and dads and for adoptive relatives. And we pray that you would strengthen and encourage them, O oh Lord, as they care for those in their extended family. We pray for those in prison and for those with relatives and friends in prison, and pre please draw near to them, O oh Lord. We pray for those who may be estranged from family and friends this morning, and we pray for those strained relationships. We pray that you would grant patience and reconciliation, and we ask your spirit to move. We pray for those who are lost and those who do not know you, O oh Lord, those who are lost and without Christ, and we pray that by your sovereign hand you would draw them to yourself. Please, O oh Lord, we pray for revival in our county, O oh Lord. And Lord, we ask and pray that you would continue to be, as we know that you are, at work in the hearts of people. Father, we have many concerns to you and uh, to offer up to you, O oh Lord, and we come uh, asking specifically for a few requests, Lord, as there are many in this room. Lord, we pray for Dale Jackson Sr. with his upcoming procedure. He couldn't have it done the other day, O oh Lord, and we pray that you would please be with him and please be with Dorothy and the, the rest of the Jackson family, Lord, and please watch over this dear saint. And we pray that this procedure would uh, be successful and would bring an end to just the severe pain that he is feeling, O oh Lord. We pray for Cecilia and her lung tests, Lord, and we pray that you continue to strengthen her and watch over her, O oh Lord. We continue to pray for John Shelley and Paula Knuckles as they receive treatment and recover, O oh Lord, and pray that you would be with them. We pray for our sister Jane as well and pray that you would be with her, O oh Lord, and uh, pray that you would, uh, Lord, preserve her eyesight, Father, please. We pray for Pat Fuller and we pray for his uh, treatment at Emory, O oh Lord, and we ask and pray that you would be with Pat and Bonnie and Connie and the rest of the family, O oh Lord, please be with him. Lord, we, uh, we pray for Barbara and Samantha Pitts, Lord, as they recover from hip replacements, O oh Lord, and please be with them. Lord, we lift up Mike O'Dell to you as he continues to uh, recover. Lord, we lift up Lori Sweeney to you, O oh Father. Please heal. Please restore. 
Father, please be with this sweet, precious family who are members of our church, Lord. We come to you as we do each week and as we, many of us do each and every day, pleading on behalf uh, of Lori. And so, Lord, please be with her and heal. Father, we continue to pray for Joyce Taylor and Jenny Owen, Lance Rowe, Leanne Petty, Leanne Burkett-Weatherford, Betty Langley, Marquita Bailey, Doris Hobbs, Heather Mintz, Cecil Williams, the list goes on and on, O oh Lord, of those who are sick and hurting and receiving treatments, Father. And we pray that you would draw near to them and pray that they would know that they have a church who loves and cares for them. Father, as we continue on, we thank you that you have been so gracious and generous with us. And then as we take up our tithes and offerings and faith promises here this morning and also throughout the week, we pray that you would help us to be gracious and generous givers. The tithe is yours, O oh Lord. And we worship you even as we give back. And we pray that you would help us to hold loosely to our possessions, as hard as it is. Help us to hold loosely to them, O oh Lord, as we cling to you. We pray that you would take these funds and use them for the good of your kingdom and our community, our state, and around the world. And Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy toward your church. We thank you for your grace, your, the redemption that you have brought for your people. We thank you for the work of Christ upon the cross for us. We thank you for your word, O oh Lord. We thank you for your sovereign grace and for seeking us when our hearts were hostile and far away from you, O Lord. Sovereignly, you have brought us home and placed us in your family. Thank you for the hope of the gospel, the truth of your word, and the fellowship that we share as a church. And be with us in a moment as we open your word. And we plead with you, O Lord, and ask that your Holy Spirit would move and change and convict. Speak to us, O Lord. Your people are listening. Soften our hearts now to receive your word with gladness and humility. And help us also to realize and ask, where else are we going to go? You, O oh Lord, have the words of life. May that stir our hearts this morning, O oh Lord. Wake us up. We can hear your word. We pray these things humbly in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, let's open up to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to continue on in our weeks-long, months-long study through the letter to the Hebrews, as we've now, I think it's 19 weeks we've been in Hebrews, just kind of taking a little bit apart each and every week, and ask that you would open up to Hebrews chapter 11. If you have no idea where the letter to the Hebrews is, that's okay. Feel free to use the table of contents. It's towards the back of the Bible in the New Testament, and go to where you see the big number 11. That's the chapter that we will be in, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 7 this morning. And so as you're turning there, I want to tell you a little story, it's a story that I saw on Reddit, which is a website that's also nicknamed the front page of the internet. I saw the story on Reddit uh, during the week and I thought it was really funny. Um, it was told by a lady looking back at her childhood and she was telling the story of when she was seven and her older brother was 12. And so you can imagine if you, those of you who have kids, you know, under the teenage years and what goes on in your house. You probably know where this is going. But she's looking back on her life when she was seven and she had an older brother who was 12. And one day, her and her brother got into a huge fight and they started calling each other names. You know, and the shouting match ensued. And the younger sister called her brother a moron. And the brother replied, if you think I'm a moron, go look the word up in the dictionary and you'll find your picture there. So doing what any seven-year-old would do, she went to the dictionary, she flipped to the M section, scrolled down M-A, you know, went down through, found M-O, found the word moron, and there, next to the entry, she found her school picture taped next to the definition for moron. <laughs> you think about just the craft that went into that. Her older brother had done that weeks ago and was just waiting for the right time to trot that out in the midst of battle. And he did so effortless, effortlessly. But she went to the dictionary, she looked up moron, and she found her picture there. You can imagine her brother just smirking. And you think about that story, it's really, really funny, obviously. I mean, you think the just genius that went into that to think, think ahead and wait for that delayed gratification. You know, it's really funny, but it does remind us of an idiom that is used in our everyday lives. And we'll say something to the effect of, if you look the word fill in the blank up, you will find their picture in the dictionary. And a lot of times we use this idiom or this sentence to describe how someone might be the absolute epitome or personification of a particular word. 
Like you think, if you go look the word evil up, you will find this person's picture. If you look the word patience up or humility or graciousness or whatever it is, you know, a lot of times we use this in conversation when we talk about someone who we love or someone who we, you know, might hate, might not love so much. And we're trying to describe just the, the weight of the characteristic that they have. And so when we think about that idiom, you know, if you look the word fill in the blank up, you'll find this picture next to the entry. When you think about that, when you hear the word faithful, when you hear the word faithful, whose pictures come to mind? Living or dead? When you hear the word faithful, if you were to look that word up in the dictionary, what pictures do you think you would find there in your own mind? Okay? The last two weeks we have been looking, or last week we looked at two aspects of biblical faith, right? As we move into chapter 11, the hall of faith, as it is known. And we saw last week that biblical faith is firmly grounded in the truth of God's word, but also the holy nature of God who cannot lie. So it is, it is grounded in these promises and what the Lord has said will happen and do and who he is, but it's also grounded in his very holy nature. He cannot lie. So his word, by default, if it comes from him, is trustworthy. It's a forward-looking faith with hope and trust in the promises found in God's word. And here you have this first quote in your bulletin from Kent Hughes. I've referenced him many times. His commentary on the letter to the Hebrews has been him and Rick Phillips. You will also see another quote there. Those two commentaries have been tremendously helpful for me in this sermon series. Look at this quote by Kent Hughes as he describes biblical faith. He says, true faith is neither brainless nor a sentimental feeling. It is a solid conviction resting on God's words that makes the future present and the invisible seen. Really helpful. At the end of chapter 10, we saw a warning against apostasy and vibrant, solid faith is held up as a cure for our wandering hearts. We get this contrast between a wandering a vision of apostasy and the cure for that, the cure for that wandering that's held up in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 that we looked at last week is this definition and idea of a solid, con, a solid con, uh, confirmed and convicted faith. This week, we're going to look at several cases, case studies, personifying biblical faith in chapter 11. We're going to do a couple of weeks on this. I put by faith part one. There's going to be other parts as they come through. And we're going to look at <clears throat> this uh, hall of faith. And we're going to basically see this definition that we looked at last week in verses one through three, case studies and how this plays out in the lives of Old Testament saints who have gone before us. So we're getting just little case studies and vignettes of this type of faith. Now, this is also not called the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Heroes. And that's important to note that these men and women who are listed here, they're listed not because they are perfect. Far from it. They are listed to remind us of the necessity of a solid faith and an active hope in the midst of suffering and persecution and the trials of everyday life in a fallen world. We have to remember, again, why was this letter written in the first place? It was written to encourage a group, a small group of Christians, probably huddled in a house church in Rome, who had left the Jewish synagogue and their Jewish community and were facing persecution from every side for claiming Christ. And the writer is writing to them to encourage them to hang in there and to press forward and to cling to Christ because Christ is superior. And so in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of persecution and the trials of everyday life, we also share those experiences. And that's why this letter is still just as relevant today as it ever has been. Because living by faith and not by sight is really hard. And we've all wrestled and struggled with doubts, especially when we feel the world is pressing in and we feel maybe persecuted or tempted in a certain way and we want to, we want to give up on Christ and walk away. And we've all felt this and had these doubts. And so where these lives are held up to us as a reminder of God's faithfulness as we are called to, to press on and persevere. Also, this is not called the hall of works. This is the hall of faith. These folks are listed to remind us of a foundational doctrine, justification by faith alone. We are reminded of this doctrine. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. We saw in verse 2 of last week that 
by this faith, faith is how the people of old received their commendation from God, received their acceptance, their justification. It was by faith alone, not by their works. Look at this other quote that you have that's really helpful by Rick Phillips. Especially as we move into looking at the, the scene of Cain and Abel. Here's what Rick Phillips said. He said, there are really only two kinds of offerings, two ways to come to God. Those that point to our own work, our own merits, our own righteousness. And those that point to Jesus Christ crucified in our place to pay for sins. Okay, if you're a note-taking type of person this morning, here's the big question. Remember, we do this each and every week. The big question this morning is, what lessons do we learn about faith here, and how do they point us to Christ? What lessons do we learn about faith here, and how do they point us to Christ? That's probably going to be our big question for the next few weeks. You know, what do we learn about faith here, and then how does it point to Jesus? We're going to see three quick points this morning. Number one, faith approaches God on his, on his terms. Faith walks with God, and faith obeys God. Okay, those are our three points. Faith approaches God on his terms. Faith walks with God. What does that look like? And faith obeys God. What does that look like? Those are the three things we're going to look at this morning. See if you can pick up on these three things as we read this morning. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. With that in our mind, see if you can pick up on these three things. Let's give attention to the reading of God's word. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord does indeed stand forever. I'm very thankful for that, and I hope you are as well this morning. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you as your people looking to your word, and we ask and pray that you would meet us here, O oh Father. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Father, meet us here. We ask that you would receive all glory and honor. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, as we start out, let's look at that first point, right? Faith approaches God on his terms. Faith approaches God on his terms. That's that first thing we're going to look at. As we begin moving through the Hall of Faith in chapter 11, we start by going back to Genesis 4. And we remember the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. And they both brought an offering appropriate to their vocations, but they brought, they brought those offerings with very different hearts. Genesis 4, verses 4 through 5 says, And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Then we look at our text this morning in verse 4. It says, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Now, why was Abel's offering received by God? That's the big question, right? Why was Abel's offering received by God? It was offered by faith, verse 1, right? By faith... We talk about the idea of faith. We look at verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God. And according to God's design. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. We talked about this many weeks ago. I know that feels like ancient history now. But we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so Abel's offering was received by God because it was offered in faith and according to God's design. Now think back to the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And you think, way, let's go way back in the Wayback Machine, okay? Go back to Genesis 3, like a page and a half in the Bible. Right after the fall, what were Adam and Eve clothed in when they were expelled from the Garden of Eden? Genesis 3, verse 21, if you're taking notes. They were clothed in garments of skin as they were expelled from the Garden. Garments of skin, and that's, that's a huge deal. 
What this did was it pointed to a blood sacrifice that was necessary to atone for sin by God's design. Instead of immediately wiping out Adam and Eve on the spot for their sin and rebellion, God made a way. You see the gospel in seed form, a page and a half in the Bible, where they walk out clothed in garments of skin because something else had died in their place. That is substitutionary atonement, which is the heart of the gospel. You don't see God waving sin away. He dealt with it. But instead of wiping out Adam and Eve, he poured his wrath on something else. And they walked out covered in that. What we see here is Abel offers a blood sacrifice. And the Bible's very careful to point out that it was the firstborn of the flock. What that means is it was the costly and best sacrifice that approached God by faith on God's terms. And because of that, it says that he was commended as righteous. That's justified by faith. He was justified, declared right. Abel brought true worship and humbly asked God to bless it. Now think about Cain. Cain did the exact opposite. He approached God on his own terms. Many scholars and commentators, everybody I saw called it the way of Cain. Cain approached God on his own terms and his offering was rejected because Cain brought self-worship and assumed God would bless it. He just assumed it. Cain's harsh reaction revealed his heart because he became angry with God and he rose up and he killed his brother Abel, making him the first martyr only three pages into the Bible. Think about the effects of the fall. We're a page and a half in, three pages in. Look at verse 4. It says, though he died, he still speaks. We're told that Abel's blood cried up from the ground, but he's also numbered among the great cloud of witnesses that we'll look forward to in chapter 12. These folks that are cheering the saints today on. That his blood still speaks. He, though he dies, he still speaks. And you think, why should we care? Why, why in the world should I care about this Cain and Abel thing? Okay, true faith approaches God on his terms. And comes confessing its sin and understanding its need for grace. And it recognizes that its works are not enough and it looks to the true and better sacrifice of Christ on its behalf. True faith comes before the Lord and says, Lord, I'm coming to you, not on my own terms, but yours. And I recognize that I have fallen short and I'm asking you to meet me and I'm asking you, O Lord, to please grant mercy and forgiveness. It doesn't come in assuming that. It comes in pleading for it and asking for it. This type of faith can only point to Christ and understands the great cost of salvation. Maybe something comes to mind and maybe it doesn't. I'll remind you of it in Luke chapter 18 verses 10 through 14. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector where you see this played out. Jesus said two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus. God I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners and Unjust adulterers are even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. And he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. As we think about that in approaching God on his own terms and recognizing that he is holy, 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 and we are what? Not, not, not. Man, y'all are listening. We approach God on his terms and recognize that he is holy and we are not. We come before him with humility, recognizing that he is the God of all the earth. And it's important for, all, for us all to reflect on how we approach God in our day-to-day -day lives. Are we approaching God on his own terms? Or are we just forging ahead with our own plans and just assuming that God is pleased with them and that he will bless them? Are we approaching God with humility and asking for wisdom and mercy? Or are we basically just bringing our own kind of pre-made plan to him and saying, Look, Lord, look what I've done. Bless this and I'm, let's move forward. Give it the rubber stamp so I can move forward. And we just assume that he's going to get it. We see that faith approaches God on his own terms. But in our second point, we see that faith walks with God. Faith walks with God. Now in verse 5, we turn the corner and we move forward a chapter in Genesis to Genesis 5. And we see the faith of Enoch. There's just a few words, I think 50 words, that completely encompass the story of Enoch. He's kind of this mysterious figure in the Bible. 
But Genesis 5, 23 and 24 says, Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And Jude 14 and 15 also records Enoch as a prophet, type of prophet of God. Enoch is a mysterious name in the Bible, but he and Elijah are the only two people recorded in the Bible who did not experience death. It says that they were taken up by God. And you think, wasn't Jesus also taken up by God? Yes, he was. But remember, three days in the tomb. Okay? What did Enoch do to, quote unquote, please God? What did he do? He walked with God by faith. And verse 6 drives this home. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. Now in the Septuagint, which is a fancy word for the Greek translation of the Old Testament, walked with God and pleased God are used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Walked with God, pleased God, those, those words there are used interchangeably. And so what uniquely defined Enoch's walk with God? What made it so unique? It was a very close relationship, a very close relationship with God. Here's what Warren Wiersbe said that I thought was really helpful. He said, Enoch had been walking with God for so many years that his transfer to heaven was not even an interruption. Enoch had been practicing Colossians chapter 3 centuries before Paul wrote the words, keep seeking the things above, set your minds on the things above, not on the things of the earth. He says it wasn't even an interruption. He was walking so closely with God that when God came and took him to heaven, it was just, just things kind of kept progressing forward. Think about the closeness of that walk. Verse 6 also sheds light on this. It says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That faith is firmly grounded in the person of God and looks forward with great hope to the promises of God. And again, we need to ask ourselves, is our faith marked by a close walk and relationship with God? Or do we just go to him when our own plans are failing or we face suffering? Does our day-to-day -day life, does it look like a personal walk with the Lord? Or do we just go to him when we, when we need him, when things go south? The Christian life is more than just an intellectual assent to a set of theological truths. It is a relationship by faith with the three persons of the triune Godhead. It is a living and active and walking faith. It is so much more than just an assent to a set of theological doctrines. We in the Reformed camp are guilty of that. We need to repent of it. We love Jesus more than we love our books. That's the call. But look at this third point here as faith obeys God. We see that faith approaches God on his own terms. Faith walks with God. So we looked at Enoch. And now faith obeys God. Now we turn our attention to the faith of Noah in verse 7. And let's remember the context for the beginning of Noah's story in Genesis 6. Okay, what was going on at the time in, in, in Noah's day? Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man. Rousing thumbs up for humanity, right? Genesis 6, 11 through 12. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Man, that sounds like a party. That sounds great. I'm like, where can I go buy a vacation home in that world? You see, things were really going south. I mean, you think Genesis 3, the fall happens, here we are, Genesis 6. We're not very far into the scripture, and everything is falling apart. That's the sinfulness of sin. It's what we are capable of without the grace of God. Darkness ruled and reigned in the hearts of men, and the fall had brought corruption everywhere. And God told Noah that he would pour out his judgment, flood the earth, and he told Noah to start building a massive ark, a massive boat on dry ground. Now put yourself in Noah's sandals. Put yourself in Noah's sandals for a minute, okay? It must have sounded crazy when he heard it. You want me to build what? Where? He may have thought everyone will think I have gone crazy. But by faith, Genesis 6.22 tells us Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And you think, what gave Noah hope during the multiple decades it probably took Noah to build a boat that was 450 by 75 by 45 feet uh, big, you know, length, width, height? It's a big boat. And they didn't exactly have, you know, modern tools there. You know, think about what gave him hope in the midst of that. 
Because God promised to make a way for Noah and preserve his family. This is covenantal language. Genesis 6 verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. And this is where we pick up in verse 7. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, okay, into the future, in reverent fear, reverent's a big word there, reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Remember, that's covenant language. God promised a covenant, covenant with his family. Remember, he gave the rainbow as the sign. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. The writer points out that Noah's faith was accompanied by a reverent fear. Another translation would be a holy reverence. Again, here's what Kent Hughes said. He said, Noah's reverent obedience tells us that at the very heart of a life of obedience, there must be and there always is a holy reverence for God. We need to be beware of obedience that is unemotional, that leaves our hearts beating at the same rate as before we believed. A reverent heart is a holy point of light in a dark world. For it is an obedient heart. What we see is Noah's faith was also an active faith. And despite the, the threat of ridicule and being seen as crazy, Noah went ahead and went ahead and put tool to the tree and started to work on the ark. And his faith exhibited the being certain of certainties that marks biblical faith. God had promised to bring judgment, which Noah believed. But God had also established a covenant and promised to protect Noah and his family, which he also believed. Noah responded with what Jerry Bridges calls a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction is what Noah responded with. I trust you, O Lord. I look to you and I know that you've promised that you're going to bring judgment. I believe it. I don't know when, but I believe it. And I believe, O oh Lord, that you've also made a promise to me and my family and that you're going to be faithful to that. And so I'm going to trust you and obey you a long direction, a long obedience in the same direction. Noah believed God and he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith, this justification by faith. And again, here's what Kent Hughes said. He said, there is a beautiful sequence that emanates from true faith. Faith involves certitude of belief, which produces obedience, which in turn produces witness. Okay, And the witness to the world around him is what the writer is speaking of in the second half of verse 7 where he says, by this he condemned the world. Kind of a tricky phrase there. This is what he's talking about. This idea of a, a faith that is a witness to those around him. Do You see, the Apostle Paul called Noah a herald of righteousness to the world of the ungodly in 2 Peter 2 verse 5. Noah's unflinching, persistent faith in the covenant promises of God were a, witness, were a witness to the watching world of God's existence and faithfulness in the midst of a fallen and broken world. Noah's faithful obedience over the long haul was a witness to the world around him. Romans verse 1, 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You see, the same thing is true for God's people today. Okay, by grace, we cling tightly to the truth of God's word. By faith, we live lives in obedience to God's revealed will. By faith, we gather together as a church. By faith, we continue to take the Lord's Supper as we proclaim the reality of the kingdom of God and proclaim the power of Christ's death until He returns, which He has promised to do. We do all of this by faith. Philippians 2, 14-16, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Okay, all of the Christian life is lived by faith as we look forward to the promises of God. Even in the midst of hardship and ridicule, we continue to look forward and we trust the Lord. You know, it may be very possible that the Lord does not return while you and I are still alive. We don't know. Think about the, the generations and decades of pastors and believers who have gone before us looking forward to the day when Christ said, I'm going to return. Will it be in our lifetime? I have no idea. 
But I still lean into it and trust it. And I still call you, lean into that. God has promised to return. Jesus has promised to return. Let's lean into that. Now we look at the faith of Abel, Enoch, and Noah, and you might be thinking, well, my faith doesn't look like that. Does this mean that there's a JV team in the family of God? The people with the super faith and then other people? Does that mean that there's like the second level there? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Remember, the writer was inspired by the Holy Spirit to include this hall of faith to encourage a bunch of tired, weary, and doubting Christians that God is always at work. The writer is pointing his audience then and now to Christ. What is he pointing to? He is pointing to the better Abel who offered his own body as the necessary sacrifice to atone for sin. To the better Enoch who walked closely with the Father and was taken up in glory after the resurrection. And to the better Noah who was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, and who endured the mocking and shame of a wicked world to rescue and redeem his family. You see, all of this points forward to Jesus. All of it points forward to Jesus. It all culminates in Christ. The better Abel. The better Enoch. The better Noah. Next week, the better Abraham. It all points forward to Christ. It all culminates at the pinnacle of it with Christ. So when you hear the word faithful, and you want to look it up in the dictionary to see whose picture is next to the entry, think of Jesus. We don't have his picture. We don't know what he looked like. But we will one day see him face to face. And that is the great hope. We hear the word faithful. We think of Jesus who is faithful to the very end. To redeem and reclaim a bunch of broken, messed up people like us. While we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. And we don't know what he looks like. But one day we will see him face to face. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Even as I have been fully known. This is the Christian's hope. This is why we walk by faith. That even though we have not seen him face to face, one day, someday, when he returns, even though we now see in a mirror dimly, one day we will see him face to face when he returns. Isn't that good news? Amen. Isn't that something to hold on to? As we find ourselves in the same predicament of the original audience, and we're doubting and we're fearful and we're wondering what in the world is going on here. The Lord still sits on the throne, church. Be encouraged. His grace is real. God exists. He has promised to return. His covenant faithfulness toward a bunch of rebels like you and me is true. And we hold fast. How do we know that it's true? How do we know that, it, that He will do what He says He will do? How do we know that all this Christianity stuff and all this Jesus stuff, how do we know that it actually happened? What do we have to point to? Look no, for, look no further than the supper. As we are reminded of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf so that rebels like us could be clothed in a righteousness not our own as we are covered in His righteousness set before us. Isn't that good news? Let's keep walking by faith. And let's keep looking forward to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. He has promised to do it, and he will do it. He has already done it for us and has promised to come and redeem us. Amen? It's good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, thank you, Father, for inspiring the writer of Hebrews to... Remind us yet again of the faith of those who have gone before us. And so, Father, help us to walk closely with you. Help us to live lives of obedience. Help us to trust you in all things. And help us to fix our eyes upon Christ. The better Abel. The better Enoch. The better Noah. Help us to realize that all the faith that we have is a gift from you. And help us to lean into your promises and to not be discouraged and to not be dismayed, but to hold fastly to your word. Hold fast to it, O Lord. Help us hold fast to the confession that we make. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be, please be with us, especially as we approach your table this morning. May we, may we take it with great joy and thankfulness, O Father, knowing that you have done all things for us. These things we ask and pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, as we come to the table this morning, the Lord knows that we are a fickle and forgetful people. I don't know if you are like me. I guess it's probably so. 
you are a fickle and forgetful person. And as we come to the table this morning, we need to be reminded of Christ's return. We need to be reminded that yet again that he is coming back. And for that to be sealed into our hearts, we need to remember his grace and mercy. And so in love and by his grace, God has given us this physical reminder that is set before us. This is a good gift given, given to us by a loving God. I'm thankful for that. But this is not a table for perfect people. This is not a table for those who have won life's lottery and have it all figured out. And if you're perfect, then we would love to read your book. But my guess is it's 100% non-success rate in this room that we all need Jesus. And so this table is not a table for perfect people. This is a table that is set for those who see their sin and their need for a Savior. It's for Christians who look to Jesus alone by faith for salvation. But it's also not the PCA's table. So if you are here and you attend another church that is faithfully preaching God's Word, if you are a member of that local body that is preaching the, the simple gospel, that we are sinful, that leaves us at odds with the Holy God, and that Jesus is the only way for us to be made right with the Father. If that is true, then this table is set for you. This is a table for Christians. It's not just the PCA's table. But if you are here and you do not know Christ, if you are not a Christian, we want you to feel no pressure to participate because Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 11 to examine ourselves and to be discerning of Christ's sacrifice and of his body and blood. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 to 29, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Okay, how are we going to do it? You received a little packet on the way in, your communion elements that you should have there with you. And as we sing the closing song, as we look to the closing song, you can feel free to sing quietly along or just follow along. Feel free to listen, pray, and then take the elements in your seat when you're ready. Whenever you're ready, take it. You're asking, why in the world are we doing that? We're trying to just minimize the amount of time that all of us have our masks off and are trying to stagger. That's why we're doing it. We're to keep you safe. So as you pray, as you have the elements at the moment, during the final song, remember we're going to build in that instrumental. That might be a good time. But at any time, feel free to take the elements. Um, if you need any help opening your packet, please slip your hand up. And either I or myself or Jerry Wormick will come. We're happy to come and help you open that if you're having problems. Okay, just slip, slip your hand up. We will come and help you out. I'll invite Jerry to come up with me now. Christ calls us to come and to feed on him and to find grace through him. And this bread and this cup that's set before us, they're signs and seals of the covenant of grace, a reminder of God's covenant faithfulness to his people. And we offer this covenant meal to you as we minister in Christ's name in the church. And on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it, saying, Take it, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink from it and do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's go before the Lord in prayer as we ask him to lead us here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when your people come to you, thank you that you are covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you, by your Spirit and by your grace, would grant us access to your throne of grace. We come and we ask that you would set apart these humble elements for a holy use. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would show us your grace, remind us of your love, and seal it deeply into our hearts as we taste and see that you are good as we get to uh, to taste and we get to touch and we get to see the gospel set before us, O oh Lord. Remind us of your faithfulness and the, the mercy that you have brought. And so, Father, we ask and pray that you would meet us here. Bless us now. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. For those who trust in Christ, for those who trust in Christ, I have good news. This table is set before you.
Please feel this as we sing the gospel. Praise God. 